It's a great pleasure for me to introduce um, Michael Shermer and Ed Larson. Their distinguished biographies I won't repeat because you find them in the handout and I don't want to take away from their time. I would just mention that both of them are famous, successful authors, and I hope that those of you who want their books signed will have the opportunity to get their books signed during the break. Both of them are going to talk about um, one of the more controversial areas that Wallace um, worked on, his spiritualist views, but the reality is that Wallace is not the first scientist to wrestle with the relation between science and religion. Distinguished scientists in our times, um, uh, Collins, Francis Collins, David Lack, the great ecologist, both of, the, both of them were devoutly religious people. How does one reconcile spiritualism and science? So first we're going to hear from Michael Shermer, and then we're going to hear from Ed Larson. You have a real treat ahead of you with both of these people. Michael. I'm Michael Shermer, the director of the Skeptic Society and the publisher of Skeptic Magazine. We investigate claims of the paranormal and pseudoscience and fringe groups. Thank you. So today I'm going to be talking about my biography of uh, Alfred Russell Wallace, which was my, actually my doctoral dissertation then converted to a biography, in which I'll be following uh, Wallace's dictum that the human mind cannot go on forever accumulating facts which remain unconnected and without any mutual bearing and bound together by no law. That is, we have the facts of history and then we have the laws that explain it, which is what Wallace did in explaining the facts of nature and which I hope to do in explaining the facts of his life. Starting with, um, starting with uh, just a little quantitative biography and the in, in part of my biography, I just sort of counted up all the stuff he did, which you saw earlier from... Uh, our, our brilliant opening talk on, on, on all the species he found. So I took all um, 747, and I broke them down by, uh, by subject, just did a content analysis, what were all, all these articles about. 747 papers, letters, articles, essays, reviews, commentaries, things like that. Uh, so it's roughly divided uh, between a biogeography and natural history, evolutionary theory, including cosmology, origins of life, plurality of worlds, but a lot on social commentary, land nationalization, anti-vaccination, women's rights, education. Much of this is from his travels uh, on anthropology. And then 7% on spirituality and, and phrenology. But that, that constitutes 52 papers. So that's, this is not a, a trivial thing. He was very interested in this topic. Uh, so to get at this, um, I described my original title was Heretic Scientist. Uh, but the publisher wanted Darwin in the title because Darwin sells more books and therein lies the problem in Darwin's shadow, so that's what we came up with. But really a heretic personality, by which I mean a heretic is one who maintains opinions on any subject at variance with those generally received or considered authoritative. What do we mean by personality is a relatively enduring, unique pattern of trait. So each of us is constituted of a number of personality characteristics. Uh, that are relatively permanent. They, they, they define us. Uh, they can change a little bit, but you know we're sort of uh, born with those and then raised with those and develop those. So by heretic personality, I mean the unique pattern of relatively permanent traits that makes an individual maintain opinions upon any subject at variance with those considered authoritative. So just think about that, what you've already heard. So supporting evolution through natural selection, that was sort of a heretical thing to do. Uh, at the time, but then once it gets accepted, challenging it and, and modifying it becomes the heretical thing to do, uh, and, and so on. Everything he did was sort of in that, in that mold. So what I'm doing here is I'm following a model set up by Frank Sullivan and his, uh, Frank's a, a Darwin scholar and a historian of science and, uh, and a psychologist. So he, in his book, Birth Order, Family Dynamics and Creative Lives, I first got this idea when I read a New York Times article about Frank's research in which uh, he said that Wallace had a 99.5% chance of accepting the theory of evolution. I thought, how do you come up with that number? <laughs> so Frank came up with that number by looking at a number of variables in thousands of individuals, their age, sex, nationality, economic class, socioeconomic status, political and religious attitudes, education, eminence, travel, conflict with parents, family size, and birth order. So in, in 2,784 participants in 28 diverse scientific controversies over 400 years, Frank found that only 34% of firstborns supported new ideas versus 64% of laterborns. 
Now, it's not like if you're a firstborn, you're never going to accept a, a revolution. It's that you're more probable to resist it than if you were a later born. Uh, and the likelihood of a later born accepting a revolutionary idea was 3.1 times higher than a firstborn and 4.7 for radical revolution. So you can, you can actually scale the kind of revolution it is. Is it a more conservative revolution or is it a more radical revolution? And, and, and this is defined in part by how much it overthrows societal bounds and structures and things like that, how threatening it feels to people. Like climate change for conservatives feels like a radical revolution because it's going to overthrow ideologies and economic beliefs and things like that. Uh, so like here's uh, Frank's data set on birth order and support for evolutionary theory. Now, the, the, the hypothesis Selloway was testing was the sort of Mark, Mar Marxian theory that class differences is what drives history. So most historians are, were trained in this, this kind of thinking that it's, most of history is conflicts between classes, but no one had ever tested it. Is it actually true? It, I mean, it's one of these plausible hypotheses you can make up and, and then find examples to fit it, employing the confirmation bias, but that's not good enough in science. So Frank actually tested it to see, because the, the premier biography of Darwin at the time was by uh, 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 Desmond and Morris, uh, called Darwin, the tormented evolutionist, because the hypothesis was evolution was a lower class uh, theory, because it supported this idea you can, you know, you can ri rise through the ranks and, you know, through, through, through change and competition or something, something like that. But Darwin was an upperclassman, so what's he doing supporting this lower class revolution? He was tormented. <laughs> anyway. Uh, and this is what caused his digestive problems and all this with nonsense. Anyway. Um, so Frank just tested this by, by, by having hundreds of historians of science uh, and experts in these various thousands of people that he measured actually rank them on a, where would you rate them on socioeconomic status and, and all these other things, uh, political beliefs and, and so forth. Uh, so the percent supporting evolutionary theory was much more by later borns than, than first borns and here's the and here's where Wallace falls in this, so he's super high, sort of in between middle and lower class. Here's some other people, Lamarck and Darwin, uh, and then those who are resisting it. Um, and so, uh, and, and then you look at personality. So now your, your theory of psychohistory is only good, as good as your theory of, of the psycho part. Uh, and so most of this was done based on Freudian psychoanalysis, which is bunk. So your theory of history based on psychology is going to be no better than that, so that's why it's been... So, well, one thing we have that is reliable is the big five, the, the five-factor personality model or ocean, openness to experience, conscientiousness, extroversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. Now, these, these, these are done by uh, paper and pencil self-report tests. So there's 50 items on this thing. I see myself as someone who is, and then you, you know, on a scale of one to nine. Uh, so what I did was I sent out the big five personality inventory to 10 different Wallace experts and historians of science, and I said, imagine taking it this way. I see Alfred Russell Wallace as someone who was ambitious, hardworking versus lackadaisical on a one to nine scale, tough-minded, tender-minded, assertive, dominant versus unassertive, submissive, organized, disorganized, rebellious, conforming, and there's a whole bunch of different adjectives. These, these tests have been correlated to what extent these different adjectives are reliable in measuring what it is you hope to measure, so the, the content validity is high, the reliability is high, and so on. On the big five, this has been tested for about 30 years now, it's considered the best. To whatever extent personality is real and it's measurable, this is the best test we have. If it turns out it's bunk, then, then what, I say, what I'm about to say is wrong. But in any case, <laughs> you just go by the best science you have at the time, which is what Wallace did. So here's what we found. Uh, Wallace scored, Pretty high on conscientiousness, 84th percentile, that is, he, he scored higher than 84% of the people that have taken this test, uh, which is mil millions now. Super high on agreeableness, just a nice guy, likes everybody, uh, and, is just, uh, and super high in openness to experience, just likes to travel, likes new ideas, likes engaging with strangers and people he's never met. Um, and uh, reasonably high in 58th percentile in extroversion, very low in neuroticism. Neuroticism is like you're anxious, you're, you're worried, you don't like to try new things because it makes you feel anxious and so forth. Now, there's a whole other discussion about to what extent these things are genetically programmed. Conservatives, for example, tend to be low on, 
openness to experience high and conscientiousness. And so some of these things may direct us toward political beliefs that we prefer that feel better physically to us. Uh, by comparison, uh, I, I also did this by surveying people that knew uh, Carl Sagan, who turns out to be high in conscientiousness, very low in agreeableness. <laughs> Same thing with Stephen Jay Gould, very high in conscientiousness, very low in agreeableness. Uh, th these are people who do not suffer fools gladly. So when some wingnut says, hey, I got this great theory of the everything, the universe or whatever, uh, someone like Wallace goes, oh, that's so interesting. Tell me all about it. And I'll think about it. And someone like Gould and Sagan just go, Puh. and uh, that's pretty much the end of, of that. So what I'm going to get at here is that uh, I think what's driving, in, in part, Wallace's um, tendency to be too open-minded to a lot of these uh, ideas that are kind of on the fringe and turn out not to be true, uh, is that he's just too open-minded. The tension in all the sciences, to, to what extent you should have an, a mind open enough to accept radical new ideas, but not so open-minded that your brains fall out and you believe every, every wacky idea that comes down the pike. The problem is, is that most ideas that people have are, are dumb ideas, bad ideas, wrong ideas. And, uh, you know, Karl Popper's theory of the philosophy of science is what he called conjecture and refutation. So science is you throw out lots of conjectures. That's fine. Just th hypothesize, to, you know, till the cows come home. But you got to be open to being refuted because most of these ideas are bad. So if, you have to, striking that balance is what we're after there. So as, as Frank summarized it uh, with our research here, uh, Frank and I did, Wallace was later born the eighth of nine sibs, middle, lower class, depending on when in his life you're looking at, and separated from his parents at age 13. It's a triple interaction effect that generates the greatest amount of support for radical scientific theories. And according to Soloway's multivariate model, which includes 12 predictors and their interactions effects, here it is, Wallace possessed a 99.5% probability of championing the theory. That's where that number comes from. Now, just parenthetically, the, the, the model is itself a Darwinian model that that firstborns, by dint of being first, are going to be bigger, stronger, faster, smarter, and so on, than their later-born sibs. And so they're going to sort of lord it over their later-born sibs, who, in competition for their parental love and resources and, and attention, have to com they can't compete on traditional standard levels with their older sibs. So they have to diversify and do something different. So, for example, comedians tend to be later borns, uh, and, you know, and, and, and later borns tend to be higher risk takers, and, and they're open to trying new things because you can't compete on the same level as your older sibs. Also, older sibs become surrogate parents, babysitting their younger sibs, and one of the things surrogate parents do is they lord it over with the rules and, and the hierarchical structure, and this is the way things are, so they become more entrenched, more conservative Anyway, that's just, there's tons of data on Frank's book there that I think is applicable here. Uh, so let's look, now I'll look at a series of these heresies of Wallace uh, and why I think he, he kind of went down this path. Now, it's not, it's not that he's sitting there thinking, oh, I'm a heretic. I'm just going to, you know, just believe radical things. Of course, it's all unconscious. But his first heresy he announced to his friend uh, uh, Darwin there in 1869, in which he said, in my forthcoming article in The Quarterly, I venture for the first time on some limitations to the power of natural selection. I'm afraid that Huxley, and perhaps yourself, will think them weak and unphilosophical. I merely wish you to know that they are in no way put in to please the quarterly readers. You will hardly suspect me of that. But are the expression of a deep conviction founded on evidence, which I have not alluded to in the article, but which is to me absolutely unassailable. So at it, 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 it all times, we will see uh, Wallace emphasizing the evidence. He's not doing this to please readers. He's not doing this on a whim. He thinks he's found scientific evidence. Um, and uh, so here's what he wrote. Uh, this is his heresy, the first one. In the brain of the lowest savages, and as far as we know of the prehistoric races, we have an organ, little inferior in size and complexity to that of the highest types, but the mental requirements of the lowest savages, such as the Australians or the Andaman Islanders, are very little above those of many animals. How then was an organ developed far beyond the needs of its possessor? Natural selection could only have endowed the savage with a brain a little superior to that of an ape, whereas he actually possesses one very little inferior to that of average members of our learned species. Uh, so Darwin uh, then wrote to Wallace, <laughs> I shall be intently, intensely curious to read the quarterly. I hope you have not murdered too completely your own and my child. <laughs> it's 
So here's the conservative elder senior scientist going, oh boy, okay, what do we got coming here? And then, then he read it. Oh, but I groan over man. You write like a metamorphosed in retrograde direction naturalist. And you, the best author, the author of the best paper ever appeared in the Anthropological Review. You, 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 you miserable, your miserable friend, C. Darwin. Uh, so the two factors that led to this sort of break is, is uh, wh what we call is hyperselectionism. That is how, okay, so if natural selection is the only force operating, and it doesn't operate presciently, it doesn't think, boy, it'd be great to have wings, <laughs> so I think I'll just design some wings, and in, in 50,000 years, birds will fly. It, it, it's a local adaptation for local environments, and there has to be a slight advantage or the characteristic will not be passed on to your genes through differential reproductive success and so forth. Uh, so how then would you explain things like uh, math, music, art, morality, consciousness, conceptual ideas like eternity, infinity, space? And he has a long uh, discussion of how do you go from molecules to mind? Uh, now, fortunately, these problems have all been solved. <laughs> now he makes a really good argument. I mean, he takes on Hume and Kant and, you know, all the great philosophers. He was a good thinker on this. And uh, he says, okay, so uh, we all agree a, a single molecule is not conscious. Why would, would two be conscious or ten or how many molecules do you need to get consciousness? Or he would, we would now say neurons or something like this. But even the molecular exchange across synapses and the synaptic gaps between neurons, it's still the same problem. How do you go from particles to what it, what it is we're doing now? And we still don't know uh, the answer to that question. That's called the hard problem of consciousness. So Wallace is really tapping into something important here. And, uh, and, and he's say, saying to Huxley and Darwin and the others, you claim that natural selection can explain everything. The burden of proof is on you to prove to me how it is it can generate that. Because you don't need to do math and artistic ability and music and think about eternity and, and all that to just breed and survive and avoid predators and so forth. You don't need any of those characteristics. So how did that come about from these molecules to these molecules just gradually? Okay, so that's, that's his argument. Then this other part, he makes kind of subtle reference to this, that uh, my opinions on the subject have been modified solely by the consideration of a series of remarkable phenomena, physical and mental, which I have now had every opportunity to uh, of fully testing and which demonstrate the existence of forces and influence not yet recognized by science. Okay, this is the, the, the spiritualist movement. So um, the, the, the scientist among the spiritualists, Wallace had gotten caught up into this whole movement of phrenology, mesmerism, spirituality, and seances, and he actually attended a seance, and like a good scientist, he made a diagram, and uh, <laughs> this is where everybody was sitting, and here's where he sat, next to the door, so nobody could sneak in, and uh, there's a sliding door over here, and he put tape on it and marked it, you know, to, so in case anybody slipped in, you know, and it was dark, you know, they always lower the lights, that tells you something, like the spirits are bothered by the lights, you know, on the other side, um, but for him, these experiences, and here's a description of one. Our seance came off, this is the one that he used for that diagram. Our seance came off last evening and it was a tolerable success. The medium is a very pretty little lively girl. The place where she sits, a bare empty cupboard formed by a frame and doors to close up a recess by the side of the fireplace in a small basement breakfast room. We examined it and it is absolutely impossible to conceal a scrap of paper in it. Miss Cook is locked in this cupboard above the door of which is a square opening about 15 inches each way. The only thing she takes with her being a long piece of tape and a chair to sit on. After a few minutes, Katie's whispering voice was heard. This is the, you know, the deceased. And a little while after we were asked to open the door and seal up the medium, we found her hands tied together with the tape passed three times around each wrist and tightly knotted. The hands tied close together, the tape then passed behind and well knotted to the back uh, chair back. We sealed all the knots with a private seal of my friends and again locked the door. A portable gas lamp was on the table the whole evening, shaded by a screen, so as to cast a shadow on the square opening above the door of the cupboard till permission was given to illuminate it. Every object and person in the room were always distinctly visible. A face then appeared at the opening, but dark and indistinct. After a time, another face quite distinct with a white turban-like headdress. This was a handsome face with a considerable general likeness to that of the medium, uh -huh. 
but paler, larger, fuller, and older, decidedly, it maybe could be a mask, uh, decidedly a different face, although like. We were then ordered to release the medium. I opened the door and found her bent forward with her head in her lap, but apparently in a deep sleep or trance, from which a touch of a few words awoke at her. Then, we then examined the tape and knots. All was as we left it, uh, and every seal perfect. Okay, so, uh, you know, he, it, to him it looks like something real is going on because to the best of his knowledge as a rigorous scientist, he's, you know, con made, made all controls possible so no cheating can go on. Unfortunately, magicians are better than scientists at fooling people. Um, and so, but he, anyway, he wrote a book about this, the scientific aspects of the supernatural. He just thinks he's doing science all the way. Uh, and so I found a copy of this, and in, so you open it up, and in the frontispiece was, was a handwritten note on, on both front, front pieces that looks like, um, let's see, it looks like this. And so I'll translate it for you here. This is, um, uh, uh, this is the copy of his sister Frances's copy of this book. And so this is the writing on, the, uh, on those frontispieces. This book was written by my brother Alfred and with 24 others was laying on my table. They had been there four days and I had not had time to give them away. One morning I had been sitting at my table writing and left the room for a few minutes. When I returned, the paper parcel was open and the books laying on chairs and tables in every direction. I immediately called my friend the medium <laughs> and told her of it. She then said to write out what is the meaning of this, though I can guess. They are to be distributed and not lay here idle. Yes, yes, by Knox. Then was wrapped out this sentence. One for my sister Frances. I have marked it. Upon this I opened one of the books and looked through the leaves and soon found the marks in red crayon, which I had on my table. I then said, if you could do this while the book was shut, you could write my name in this book while it lays under my hand. In a few minutes, I opened the book and found Francis Wallace written. I said, now, dear spirit, write my marriage name. I shut the book and in two minutes opened it again and the second name was written, Francis Sims. <laughs> I mean, this is fantastic stuff. Of course, I have no idea how this was done. I mean, we, you know, it's just, it's just an artifact. Clearly, it's possible to do these things. Somebody could have rigged it up and set it up ahead of time. Or maybe, you know, the spirits are moving. <laughs> but this is the sort of thing that Wallace would find very compelling, and Darwin and Huxley would not find particularly compelling. Uh, and uh, so also, Wallace got involved in a, in a trial of, uh, of a, a man named Henry Slade here, who was a medium, American medium, who came to England uh, to do his psychic readings. And uh, Edwin Lancaster was a student of, of uh, Thomas Huxley, and he was a skeptic. Uh, and so they went, he, Lancaster and one of his colleagues went to one of these psychic readings and the, and the little, uh, the little uh, tablets that were the, the mysterious writing was to appear on, they, they grabbed before he could finish, before he even asked the question, the answer was already there. And uh, so uh, he was sued for, um, well, there, was, there were laws about... Um, uh, you know, astrologers and tarot card readers and all that scamming people. And uh, so he was sued under this as sort of as a type of fraud. So this is the kind of thing that's called slate writing. So uh, you, you close the slate, you put a piece of chalk in there, the slates are blank, you close it, and you sit there and the spirits do their thing, the lights are off and, and so on. And, and uh, this is one way that it's done that was exposed later. Uh, you can also do it with a thumb tip writer, so you just sort of move the slates off to the side, and you're holding the slate like this, and you can, you can write what you want with your thumb. Lots of different magic tricks way to do this sort of thing, of which Wallace was uh, not aware. Uh, and Huxley, I think, said it best here, the skeptic. Uh, he well knew that scientists are not trained in the art of detecting conscious fraud. In these investigations, the quality of the detective are far more useful than those of the philosopher. A man may be an excellent naturalist or chemist, and yet make a poor detective. And my favorite quote from, uh, from all this from Huxley is, better live a crossing sweeper than die and be made to talk twaddle by a medium hired at a guinea a seance. <laughs> uh, and uh, as, as Melder discovered, um, on the other side of this trial, Wallace was testifying on behalf of Slade, and Darwin's privately gave money to the prosecution to help the side uh, debunk this. Now, neither Wallace nor Darwin knows how the tricks are done. 
It's really kind of a setup of how open you are to these kinds of ideas. An extraordinary claim, is there extraordinary evidence or is it just you kind of wish it were true or you kind of suspect it's not true? And that's kind of what it comes down to. For Wallace, he said uh, to E.B. Poulton in 1889, I think I know that non-human intelligences exist, that there are minds disconnected from a physical brain, uh, that there is therefore a spiritual world. This is not for me a belief merely, but knowledge founded on the long-continued observation of facts. And such knowledge must modify my views as to the origin and nature of human faculty. Now, he's not a traditional believer in God. He wasn't religious. That would be a non-heretical thing to be. That's what everybody is. Uh, and yet, everybody and most of his scientists were skeptics. So the heretical thing to do was to believe in this afterlife world, the spirit world. He called it an overruling intelligence of some sort. Didn't postulate what that was or who it was or anything like that. In his uh, article on spiritualism in Chambers' Encyclopedia, Wallace defines spiritualism as a science based solely on facts. It is neither speculative nor fanciful. On facts and facts alone, open to the whole world through an extensive and probably unlimited system of mediumship, it builds up a substantial psychology on the ground of strictest logical induction. Okay, so he, he thinks he's doing science. Uh, but another one of his heresies, this is the kind of thing Huxley and Wallace would have never responded to, but Wallace ran into an ad run in a magazine, a popular magazine, by this guy, John Hampton, who was a flat earther. Uh, and this was his model of what the earth looks like. So you can indeed circumnavigate the globe, even though it's flat, you just go that way. <laughs> and, uh, and, he, and he published this uh, pamphlet, Earth Not a Globe, and, uh, and he offered 500 pounds uh, to anybody that could prove that the earth is actually a sphere. Uh, and, uh, and again, Wallace, uh, Darwin or Huxley would have you know, not, not bothered with you know, the wing nuts. Uh, but, but Wallace was so open to these things, he actually took up the challenge. Uh, and so he set up a, uh, on a canal, a long canal. It was like 10 kilometers long in England, a stretch, in which uh, you would look through uh, this little like telescope, little spotting scope, and have a, on a brick wall a little marker there. And so if it's flat, that little marker will appear th through this dot that's in the middle of it, and if not, this. So it looks like that. So if, if, it's, if it's round, then it'll look like this. And if it's flat, then, then this, would, this would appear uh, on that one. So they, 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 they set it up, and they had um, a neutral judge who would be the assessor of this test. And, uh, and uh, so he looked, looked through the, the scope and found, indeed, that that's exactly what they found. And, and Mr. Carpenter, the judge, signed, signed it and said, the, the earth is curved, Wallace wins. So, but Hampton had his own judge who looked through the scope and said, nope, it looks to me like it's... <laughs> uh, so uh, uh, Wallace didn't get his 500 pounds. 500 pounds would be the equivalent of a year's work, working's wages, working man's wages at that time. So that's a lot, not a substantial amount of money. Uh, he also wrote on uh, land nationalization. He was a socialist. He proposed this whole thing that he had these wealthy donors that were going to buy this big plot of land and turn it into sort of like a little utopian commune. Anyway, the, the donors as donors are wont to do if you don't stay on. <laughs> never came through with the money. And uh, so that, that never came to fruition. Uh, he was an anti-vaxxer. He said, vaccination is a gigantic delusion. It has never saved a single life. He had all this data he had massed, amassed. Again, it's a little heretical, but not unreasonable at the time because they didn't have anything like the data sets we have now for the, the effectiveness of vaccines. Uh, and uh, so anyway, the, to, to conclude, the essential tension in science, to repeat, is this between uh, you know, open-mindedness to new ideas, uh, but most new ideas are wrong, so you have to be somewhat conservative. Science is by nature very conservative because of this fact. I think Wallace, by temperament, by personality, I like what uh, Richard Milner said in his little uh, video lecture on, on the Slade trial, that um, Wallace was such an honest, nice guy that he had a hard time believing other people would just look you in the face and lie to you. That, that people are just out and out frauds. I think he had a hard time believing that. And, and yet, there are a lot. Uh, and so that's why you have to be conservative. He just erred too much, I think, on the side of openness. But on the other hand, if you're open-minded, at least like he is, you get a symposium uh, <laughs> in tribute to you. Thank you very much.